So yes, hi, I'm Pat Holmes. I was a founding VP of technology at a company that went from business plan to IPO to sold over 20 years. Uh, I'm also an active angel investor and involved in the Pasadena Angels, on the board of the Pasadena Angels. Uh, please hold your questions at the end. I do have a full agenda. I don't know about a wealth of knowledge, but maybe uh, some cheap trinkets of knowledge. On my website, there are links to books and articles and videos that I think are helpful for people starting a business or for general self-improvement. And occasionally in my talk, I'll refer to some uh, books or articles, and they're all on, on the website, patrickdholmes.com. Uh, I have 30 minutes. I could do 30 minutes on each of many of these slides. Instead, I'll hit some key points, illustrated with some stories. Uh, hopefully, it'll be fun. Uh, occasionally, I'll ask you for a show of hands, ask a question. For example, uh, who doesn't like raising their hand? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my IPC experience and some lessons about management and building stuff. So IPC was basically a medical group of hospitalists. Uh, a hospitalist is a doctor who takes care of patients in the hospital. They only work in the hospital, they don't have an outside office. There were 200 doctors doing this kind of work in 1996. Today there are over 50,000 hospitals in America. I was an Oracle consultant when I met Adam Singer and his cousin uh, in January of 1997. In fact, I'd been at their office for exactly an hour and the cousin said, why don't you come work for us and we'll give you like 10% of the company. Like an idiot, instead of saying yes or let's discuss it, I d instead decided to make a joke and said, I think we should date first before we get married. That was a lost opportunity. Dr. Singer saw that the hospice movement was going to be huge in, for medicine. You know, they had a business plan. They were trying to raise seed capital. I read it, but sat on it. In May of 97, they raised $500,000 in seed capital. Uh, six months later, we were sitting and having lunch at Ernie's on Lancashire, and, and somebody said something that made my head explode, and I realized this thing was really going to happen. And if I wanted to be part of something like this, I needed to wrap up my consulting business and become an employee which I did. And so th three months later, the CFO and I started on March 1st, 1998 as employees six and seven. We arrived together and she, uh, she insisted that I open the door for her and let her walk in first. So I, she was six and I was seven. In May of 98, I put some of my own money in to have more skin in the game. And over the course of the next nine and a half years, we grew and took in roughly 40 million in venture capital and went public in 19, uh, January 2008. We kept growing. Seven years later, we were bought by Team Health, a larger public company, for 1.6 billion. And then 18 months later, Team Health itself, the combined company, was bought and taken private by Blackstone Private Equity for 6.1 billion in February of this year. In the chart in the bottom right, you can see the number of encounters going up, that nice little chart that, that you always want in a startup, to the right and going up. And it was the number of billing encounters, from zero to over seven million billable encounters a year. Um, the, the top chart is our stock price. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the same slope, but it was a happy ride. And there was one day there in November 2013 where our, our capitalization was over a billion dollars. So I went from small to large. I went from a business plan to seed capital, to startup, to IPO, to mid-sized public company, to large public company. As, as IPC, we went from zero employees to over 4,300 employees in August of 2015 when, we, when the uh, purchase was announced. Combined with Team Health, it was over 24,000 employees. I went from being the IT department all by myself to one of 210 people in IT uh, with an de IT department with multiple vice presidents, multiple silos. One thing you realize in a, with experience like this is in a small company, you learn how to get things done. But in a large company, you learn how to get things done in a large company. A large company necessarily has many policies and procedures and layers of management and multiple approvals. So one example from 2001 of kind of a bold and nimble move is we had a vendor developing the next generation of our doctor's app. And it was nearly done, but I get this frantic call on a Friday morning from the CEO founder of the software development company. And 
he didn't have money for payroll, and unless he got an immediate infusion, he was going to go bankrupt. It occurred to me then, they were developing our software on their servers. We didn't have the source code. I don't know if any attorneys here, but I just, the idea that we would have to go to a bankruptcy judge and ask them for the source code that we paid like 75% for or something, it, you know, might take months or years. So, uh, who here is familiar, show of hands, who's here familiar with the idea that you should not bring problems to your manager without also su suggesting one or more possible solutions? It's a good principle to follow if you haven't heard that before. So, I thought about it for a few minutes and my manager was out, so I went directly to the CFO and proposed we pay off the balance of the contract. We owed him, the last payment for completion was $125,000. And my solution was, let's just declare it done. We'll give them the 125,000. We'll get, we'll, we'll win it, you know, with, under the condition they send us the servers and the software and our source code. We'll hire one of his contact programmers and we'll just finish the job ourselves. CFO asked a few questions and then she agreed. And minutes later, the wheels started turning. That was nimble, right? It's hard to imagine making that kind of bold decision that quickly in a large company. It's also an example of why a startup is more fun than a large company. So I'm going to talk about some of the things I think I've learned you know, over these 20 years. And um, they're going to revolve around three themes. I think three themes, three themes kind of run through all these topics. First is focus. You will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. You have to have focus. And I'm not talking just about turning off social media or putting off email, but they're, especially in a startup, they're often competing urgent and important priorities. And you just have to make choices and focus on the most important choice. All right. Adjust that. Make an adjustment. The second is delivering value. Strive not to be a success, but rather to be a value. Whether you're just out of college or far along in your career, think about how you add value or how you would add value to a company that you want to work for. And strive to add value. Success will follow. And the third theme is constant improvement. This is my favorite quote on self-improvement. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by conscious endeavor. Henry David Thoreau. Can you be one or five or 10% better at something in your job? Especially if you're a knowledge worker, learn a new technique. What if a small but subtle change in your activities could make you five or 10% happier? Who thinks that 5% happier is an, does that sound like an achievable goal? Right? There's a great book, 10% Happier, Dan Harris, I recommend. So, there's a wonderful story about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. I just found out about it. Apparently, it was in a Warren Buffett HBO special recently. And they, they, it was early in their relationship, and somebody decided or challenged them to write down on a piece of paper one word that represented the secret to their success. And famously, when they turned, revealed what they had written down, they each had written the same word, focus. I think about all the words they didn't write down. Hard work, timing, luck, capital, ex you know. Who's heard that story before? It's a great story. Uh, it, you can also read about it online. Um, you know, focus, I think, is the essential characteristic of an, of an entrepreneur. And Adam Singer, Dr. Adam Singer, my favorite entrepreneur, is a great example of that. You have to be blind to the other opportunities and all the other things you could be doing. He, he, he was a successful pulmonologist, making a lot of money. He didn't need to do a startup, but he had this vision, and, all, and, and he had to pursue it. And likewise, you have to be, this is Adam's definition, you have to be blind or indifferent to risks. To be such a zealot in your ideas that you would let few risks stand in the way. So determined that you're just going to overcome, ignore, bypass any risks. And another principle I mentioned was self-improvement. You know, it's, it's pretty uncommon for a startup CEO to still be the CEO as the company grows to 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, 500 million in revenue going public. The exceptions you know about, but it's not the rule. 
Um, I, you know, I've been doing angel investing for four years. I think three or four of the eight or nine companies I've invested in have already had the CEOs forced out, and they're nowhere near far along, that far along. Adam aspired to stay CEO, so he researched and studied what it means to be CEO. And, he, and he, 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 he put that reading into practice. And he grew as CEO as the company grew, right up until we were bought by Team Health 17 years later. As a company, you need to have focus. There's a great book by Jim Collins called Good to Great, business book. You know, you need to have a simple and clear mission for the company and its revenue model, a, a single idea that you perfect, and Jim Collins called it the hedgehog principle. You also need a clear focus on who your most important customer is. IPC was a bunch of doctors taking care of other doctors' patients while they're in the hospital, so it was multi-sided. Our customers were the providers who referred patients to us so they could go home and have dinner with their family instead of going to the hospital. The patients and their families who had questions, the hospitals, you know, we worked in, the insurance companies who paid us. But Adam, to his credit, determined that the most important customer were our employee doctors. If they're happy and productive, success will follow. It's the doctor stupid was a slogan we had on computer printout paper. I think it literally was dot matrix printer. I don't know, who's old enough to remember dot matrix printer? All right, well, maybe I shouldn't have asked that question. So we had this at one end of our conference room, it's the Dr. Stupid, to remind us, to constantly remind us to focus on our employee doctors, making them happier and more productive. For example, a story, we had turnover issues. Uh, we had this distributed workforce all over the United States, but by the time we got bought, we were in 28 states. And, and we had a fair amount of turnover and the doctors didn't feel connected. So four times a year we started having these leadership retreats where we would bring 75 to 100 people to our corporate headquarters here in North Hollywood to help doctors feel like a part of the team. To train them to be good hospitalists as we define that, as Adam defined that. To visit the office and meet the billing department and the call center and the IT department and all the other people who supported them. And this moved the needle. And, but it wouldn't have happened if we were focused on five different priorities. It was, it was a very clear focus for the company. You need to focus on having the right people in the right job doing the right things, delivering value. Jim Collins, again, in Good to Great, he called this getting the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats. One example is our CTO flamed out in 1999 and we needed somebody like me to continue being the technologist but we also needed somebody to run the rest of IT to be like the CTO or VP of IS to negotiate contracts about the data center or about which video conferencing system to install in each region. And I had a friend who had experience as an IT manager who was available. Long story short, I, I basically hired a friend to be my boss. Now, maybe it would have been better my, for my career to aspire to be the CTO, but then I would have had to replace myself as the Oracle Programmer Database Technology guy. So I think that was an, an unusual situation. I mean, how many people here have ever hired a friend to be their boss? <laughs> right? But I think it was a good example of having the right people in the right seats on the bus. Another principle is hire slow, fire fast. Our last Oracle developer we hired, uh, you know, we read hundreds of resumes. We talked to dozens before we, we hired somebody and we wanted to make sure it was a great fit culturally and, and that, they, that he'd be able to keep up and that he had the technical chops. A couple of years earlier, we had made a hiring mistake with an employee in a similar position who was weak in a fundamental requirement of the job. It was painfully obvious it was never going to work. We hired him on a Monday. I was gone the first th three days. That's probably the only reason we waited till Friday. Now, I, you have to take my word that it was unsalvageable, but I think also in a situation like that, you need to be decisive, and it's more compassionate, I think, to act decisive, decisively rather than tr drag things out and better for the morale of the team. I have some ideas about managing employees. It was pretty late in the game when I embraced being a manager. But again, I started reading about it and I mentioned, I'll mention some books that I found very really helpful. So how do you keep your employees focused and delivering value and constantly improving? 
How do you keep your employees accountable? You could have weekly status reports, tasks completed, tasks to be completed, obstacles. I found it very helpful to use an agile, agile methodology, specifically Scrum. There's a great book on Scrum called The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by the guy who basically invented Scrum. And when we implemented Scrum, and it, what it does is it gives you these mechanisms for process improvement that, and a very short feedback loop. And one of, the, one of the artifacts of Scrum is having daily stand-up meetings. And we saw immediate benefits, like the first week of turning on our uh, Scrum initiative because we had you know, employees who would send an email to somebody and not get a response and sit on it for a week. And then we'd, if we had, were having weekly meetings, weeks might go by before we resolved that. But instead, we were able to identify and eliminate obstacles immediately through our daily stand -up, as a result of our daily stand-up meetings. One of the remarkable, remarkable advantages of using an Agile technology is that the visibility and peer pressure of using the system motivates people to work harder and smarter than, than any manager would be, be willing or able to ask of an employee one-on-one. -on -one. The system drives the improvements, not, not, not just personal charisma or, or stamina. Who here has used Scrum or some other Agile technology? Kanban, are you a fan? Extreme programming. Extreme programming, another good one? Yeah, no, excellent. You know, otherwise, be intentional, research how to be a manager or a leader. One of my favorite books on the subject is The Hard Thing About Hard Things by the famed venture capitalist Ben Horowitz. And one of my takeaways was recurring scheduled one-on-one -on -one meetings with each employee with an agenda prepared by the employee. And it's not to talk about their current projects, it's to talk about what they want now in their career, surface and resolve issues at work, Maybe they're having trouble with, a, with an employee or a man, another manager. Help them set goals, help them grow. Encourage employees to track their accomplishments and review them with you. This also makes annual reviews easier. You don't want your only checkpoint, your only heart-to-heart -heart with an employee over the course of an entire year to be the one annual review meeting. And if you leave it to chance, you're just never gonna have the meeting. You're always too busy. So putting these recurring one-on-one -on -one meetings on the schedule was very helpful. You have to manage your boss and your peers. How do you demonstrate that you, me, are focused, I am, whether that I am focused on delivering value every day? You need to manage the expectations of your boss and peers, cultivate those relationships. In a large company especially, be more sensitive to politics and staying in your lane. Um, you know, I wish I had done a better job of managing up and sideways. Uh, I used to keep a me folder tracking my accomplishments, but then I got involved with fixing Sarbanes-Oxley IT controls and I had a depressing couple of years and I got out of the habit. I could have asked for recurring one-on-one -on -one meetings. This is a book I only read like two years ago. I mean, this, a lot of this stuff I'm still learning. Maybe a year ago. Um, anyway, we had a new CIO who asked an influential peer about what I do, and that person said they had no idea what I did or how I added value. That wasn't a helpful comment. Other than having had a good annual review, I wasn't prepared to rebut that kind of feedback. It would have been better to have cultivated that relationship more with my peer. Who here keeps a me folder to keep track of your accomplishments and projects completed? One person. Well, that's a good suggestion, I think. It also makes you feel better, especially if you're depressed or discouraged by something. You can go flipping through it. Also helps when you're preparing for your own annual review. Otherwise, of course, you have to do the basics. Show up. Don't make commitments you can't make or can't keep and keep the commitments you do make. Be a person that people look forward to having in a meeting. A little more to say about that in the next slide. Be fun to work with. And one thing I certainly plan to do in my next gig is say, is ask, how will my success be measured? How will we know if I've succeeded? Set up with you know, specific goals or even specific metrics. Lastly, on managing yourself, your personal focus, your personal value, constant improvement. Are you constantly trying to improve? Who feels like that, that's a daily goal or weekly goal? You should. Who's heard of growth mindset versus fixed mindset? I recommend you look that up. 
uh, when, if someone asks you, do you have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset, the correct answer is growth, just a little hint. <laughs> the difference between who you are and what you want to be is what you do. Now, it helps if you have focus on making sure you get the most important things done. And there's a great book called The One Thing by Keller of Keller Williams Real Estate. And I, if you're gonna only read one book on self-improvement, I recommend this book. I think I finished it like four months ago. I mean, this is new to me. But because I've been reading this kind of stuff, I finally encountered it, or a friend recommended it. And one of the things I like about it is it brings together the ideas from a lot of other decent books into one book, almost like a unified theory of self-improvement. Similar to the seven habits of of uh, have successful people, but I, I think the one thing is maybe even more accessible. Um, you know, another principle is don't complain. If you compl it's kind of like the don't bring a problem to your manager without offering a solution. If you complain without offering a solution, you're just whining. Instead, ask yourself, what can I do to make this better? So one of my stories from IPC is we had this major project in 2006 to integrate our clinical information system with our medical billing system to automate the transfer. We were doing paper billing up until that point. We ended up, I did a rough calculation, we figured that we saved at least $7 million a year by once we completed this project. There was a point where the project looked like it was gonna fail and I took it over and I willed it to succeed. It was one of those failures not, failure is not an option moment. But more importantly, the, the medical billing software in the company drove me nuts, and I complained a lot. You know, the, I didn't like the way the software did this or did that, and I didn't like the way they, the company responded to some issue we're having. So I realized that the whining was unproductive, unproductive and unattractive. So I decided to go to their national conference and get to know them, and it turns out they were great people. We ended up being excellent partners. I became president of their user group for six years. So instead of radiating stress and complaining about other people or situations, take responsibility and say, how can I make this better? Who here is familiar already with waterfall method versus Agile or Scrum? Not everybody. So I, I forgot to take my pointer out of the bag, but if you look in the top right corner, the waterfall is a fairly linear process. And even though some people think it's a straw man, there are people still do this. And we had a failed project that followed this. And basically you don't do any programming to get all the requirements and then you design it and then you spend months programming it. Before. And often three, six, nine, 12, 18 months go by before anybody gets to see what was built. And it often turns out to be something that's not quite right or not right at all or that no one will use now. And so various agile tech methodologies like Scrum, and that's supposed to be the represented in the bottom left corner, they have an iterative loop where you're constantly getting feedback. And in Scrum, it's, you know, minimum of a, the length of a sprint, which is typically two or three weeks, possibly four weeks, if you have slow programmers. I, that's not fair. It depends on your technology and your situation. But the point is that you, you, you should be delivering software, the usable software, every X number of weeks. Two great books on the subject, uh, Scrum, which I already mentioned, and also Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And, and in, but in general, you, especially nowadays, you should be thinking about how you can deliver value in hours or days or weeks instead of weeks or months or years. You need to shorten that feedback loop and avoid working on something for months to find out it's not right. I still see this as an angel investor. Companies that come, they've been working for a year and a half or two years on something, and then, and then they find out that nobody wants it, or they like it, but they're not willing to pay for it. It's a nice to have. You have to avoid that. I know of VCs and angel investors besides me who won't invest in a company unless the entrepreneur is talking and walking the lean startup methodology language. I already mentioned at IPC how Scrum saw an immediate benefit in removing obstacles in a timely manner. But we also had this failed data warehousing project with outside consultants brought in by some C-levels. And one big reason why it was a spectacular failure was that they followed Waterfall. It was a year in a huge amount of money, seven figures, before we finally saw a very disappointing result. 
I, I sincerely believe if they'd used agile methods instead and maybe developed one department at a time or one metric at a time and used, you know, a better software, the project likely would have turned out better. Some thoughts on build versus buy. Everything you work on is a choice. What should you focus on? Where can you add the most value? What can you delegate? What should you focus on improving? In the 1980s, we had, we, we had a payroll package from Radio Shack to do our own payroll in this one situation. Nobody does that anymore, right? You all just use ADP or Paychex or one of those. Now with software as a service company, you can outsource benefits and HR and accounts payable and expense management and much, much more. So it's more strategic than ever to decide to build versus buy. And also if you're building something, whether to outsource or to keep it in-house. Who here has managed an outsource project? Outsource program project, just one or two hands. You know, there's a, I will say that there are hidden costs and not obvious costs. So, you know, if you decide to do it in-house and you need to scale up or then, it, you know, it's more expensive and time consuming to hire a, a second programmer or a third programmer. More painful to let go if the, if the situation arises. But also with outsourcing, you have hidden expenses. My, I have a friend I like to talk about the blue room problem. You tell someone to paint the room blue and you come back and everything's blue. The door handles, the windows, the window shades. You know, so that when you, especially, you know, with our team, when we had a team in India and our team in the Ukraine, you know, there were communication issues and delays. There's 10 hour time differences. And it was necessarily less agile, though there are ways you can make it work, especially if you have someone locally who speaks both languages and is your go-between. So we had an Oracle database. IPC had this Oracle database. We needed a DBA, but it was a simple database. And if we, if we hired one DBA, it would have been very expensive. And the person might want to take a vacation or get sick or get bored with our simple database and go get a more interesting job. So instead, I signed up for a remote DBA service in 1999. We're still using it, but they're still using it. It's the best decision I ever made. We contract for like 20 hours and maybe 40 hours now a month. And we have an assigned DBA who's just like a member of our team, but if she goes on vacation or is unavailable for some reason, there's 15 other DBAs that can cover for her. Great, great example of outsourcing a function. With our doctor's application, we developed eight versions of it while I was there, three of them in-house and five outsourced. So, you know, something to consider, you know, talk to people who have had experience with this, you know, if you're struggling with decisions like that. I want to make two points about managing vendors. Um, it, I don't know how enlightening this is, but it's really near and dear to my heart. You know, you, should, you really think about which vendors will focus on you and care about delivering value to you and care about improving their software. It's often not the large public companies, especially the public companies. Oracle and Microsoft are famous for delivering buggy software to meet some marketing objective and then fixing the bugs later. And I, I, I felt, did you know that Oracle didn't even have a version one of their software? The first version was version two. You can look this up on the Wikipedia page. It's because Larry Ellison said, nobody will buy version one. Let's call it version two. This is the kind of stuff that made him a billionaire, but it doesn't make you a happy customer. And I fell for this a couple times where they delivered software that was version 4.0, but it was a complete total rewrite, and it was, it was actually version one of a GUI, and then there's this other product that was version five, and it turns out that was a complete total rewrite. It was full of bugs. One example from IPC that, uh, well, one of those examples from IPC, but another one was this data masking product. So if you've got healthcare information about patients in a database and you want to make a development test database, you need to mask that information so that it's useless, so it's scrambled or some, in some way made anonymous so you can't extract real patient information out of it before you turn it over to your development team or your testers, especially if your development team is offshore. So Oracle's data masking product would take 10 hours to use every time we used it. It ran forever, it was fixed, broke, it changed things it shouldn't change. And even though we'd already paid for it, we went and bought software from this little company called Mentis. It took five minutes to run instead of 10 hours. It ran in half the time. And it, did, it, it, it didn't have any of the defects of the Oracle software, the large, big, safe company. Again, you know, people, why do people pick large companies? Because it seems safe. 
right? Well, it's a big company. They'll have plenty of resources. Yeah, but they're also so big that they don't care about you. With Mentis, when we did have issues, we'd get a response immediately and we could talk to their developers directly if necessary. The second point is regardless, large or small, support your vendors. Be a beta site. I was a de facto beta site for the Oracle Lite database. Um, give them feedback. Attend their conferences if it makes sense. Be a reference customer. Get involved in their user group or start their user group or become president of their user group like I did with the medical billing system from GE Healthcare. Who participates in one or more user groups? Good. Or has attended a work-related conference? This is a good thing to attend this kind of thing, right? The tech on tap. Hint, you get extra credit with me if you've spent your own money and time to do this. I love this kind of commitment in candidates I'm thinking about hiring. So I'm at an inflection point looking for my next gig and I've had a few months to ponder what I might do more of or do differently. Certainly be more proactive and less reactive. More focused, more intentional. Again, I didn't embrace being a manager until a few years ago. Deliver value more frequently and document it. Now that I know, now that I know about Scrum and Lean Startup, use those principles. Create processes and procedures so that I can document and then delegate so I'm not the only person who knows how to do this stupid thing. I started 17 years ago and it's ugly and hard to maintain. Um, you know, I, as an angel investor, I meet a lot of startup. Do I have any startup CEO founders in the room? Cool, great, more power to you. Would you agree that your goal is to create a company with focus that delivers clear value with a sense of urgency and is constantly working to improve itself? Yeah, oh, uh, I've got some great books on my website. I mentioned the hard thing about hard things, good to great. Also, two great books on leadership that I love called Leaders Eat Last and Turn the Ship Around. At a higher level, I think the role of the CEO and leadership team is to provide clarity, cohesion, and communication, which I'm pretty sure I got out of another book. I'm not sure which one. To, first of all, intentionally, intentionally set direction and strategy, not just be buffeted around by who, which customer is screaming the most. And more importantly, intentionally creating culture and defining the company values. Then you create cohesion by clearly communicating culture and strategy throughout the company. Make sure everyone's on the same page. Ultimately, people want a sense of purpose to be part of a coherent team. Doing something that matters with people you care about. Engaged in productive work. Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, felt so strongly about culture that he made a 125-page slide deck about the kind of people they wanted to hire and the kind of people they want to be at Netflix. Pretty entertaining to flip through that. A link to that is also on my website. So the top three takeaways, I think you have probably uh, could answer this if I quizzed you. First, focus, being intentional. All right, second, deliver value daily. Now, I put that in quotes. I'm not, even in Scrum, you don't deliver working software every day. It's at the end of each sprint. But the point is to have a sense of urgency. And to think about agile and iterative processes that deliver value more frequently. You get the feedback in short intervals. And, and, and with something like Scrum, it, there's a built-in mechanism for constant, constant process improvement. And thirdly, constant improvement. Yourself, your company, your processes, and your systems. And I'm going to cheat and add one more. Have fun. Enjoy the process. If you step back from it, it's like a game. Maybe it should be. I have this friend, Rich Nemec, who's an icon in the Oracle space, top speaker at international conferences, best-selling books on DBA topics. And he once described being a DBA as like playing a video game. You get some report that's running for two hours and you pull this lever and yank in this string and now it runs in 30 seconds and you're a hero and it's fun. It's got a built-in feedback loop that makes it really entertaining. But I also thought in general that's a really happy and helpful way to approach your work. Like it's a game, it's a puzzle to figure out. Lastly, I'd like to say that Einstein said, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. So keep moving. And, uh, and with that, I'll open it up to questions.